So the main purpose of our mentorship program is to introduce people to mentorship, give them some good food, and also introduce them and hopefully inspire people to give more charity. Uh, at Platinum Properties, we sell a lot of real estate, residential real estate, so anybody listening, anywhere, if you need a house sold or a condo sold, please give us a call. We're very, very happy and proud. We have Robert Minus Freeman today and publicly acknowledge how much you've changed our lives for the better and thank you very much for doing so. Uh, our subject today is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, what is life? <laughs> <laughs> What's well the popular life. purpose? Yes. <laughs> what do most people believe life is? I think most people can distinguish between living and surviving. Nobody is content with surviving. This is just for the camera. <laughs> <coughs> People know the difference between living and surviving. And people don't want to just survive, they want to live. A problem that comes up is that we don't always distinguish between living and existing. <coughs> so there's surviving, existing, and living. The talent is to distinguish between existing and living. The difference very simply is existing means taking up space. You exist by occupying space. Occupying space has certain demands. Just to exist, you need to eat, you need to sleep, you need a house, you need stuff. Just for your existence. Existence is a burden. It demands a lot and gives back very little. So existing means like to be or not to be. To be means to take up space and to use up resources clothing, food, stuff. Also, existing is a little embarrassing. You take up space, that's it. Life, on the other hand, means the effect you have or the influence you have, the contribution you make by existing. That's your life. So existence basically means I am a needy creature. God created me with demands, with needs, just to exist. I also have the opportunity to make a difference. So existence is what I need. Life is what I'm needed for. A person who feels that they're not needed doesn't have a life. We talk about getting married to, uh, you know, people who are looking to get married. Should a man say to a woman, please marry me. I can't live without you. Sounds pretty nice. But either he's lying or he really means it and he needs serious professional help. <laughs> <laughs> so if a man says to a woman, please marry me, I can't live without you, should she marry him or run away? <coughs> On the other hand, if a man says, please marry me, I can live without you. Not very romantic. So what should a man say? A man should say, please marry me. I can exist fine without you, but that wouldn't be a life. So life means what I can do, what I can contribute, what I am needed for. Who needs me? It's very depressing to think that no one needs you. But my existence is what do I need? And you find that people get depressed when they're doing fine. People in third world countries don't get depressed because their survival or their existence is, d is real. The demands are real. So they're busy trying to exist. When you finally make it and your existence is fine, it's secure, 
for the next 10 generations, you have enough to exist on. Then you get depressed. Because then you ask, what? What for? Where's my life? So going out to work is called going out to make a living? No. Going out to make an existence. When you come home, you start to make a living. When do you feel personally most alive? You feel, mo I don't know if it's not just me. You, you. You feel most alive when you don't think about yourself. When you're so <coughs> inspired with something you're doing that you forgot that you exist. That is, that is, that's alive. If a day can go by and you hadn't thought about yourself, that's almost like being in heaven. And is that what you're finding in the world today? That's what we're finding very little of. How do you change that? Well, to change that, you've got to go against the entire media, the whole um, mentality of, uh, of the West. It's all about me and what I can have and what I need <coughs> and um, how I can make my existence better. I, I saw this little cartoon, some magazine, probably on the airline. This kid is standing by the blackboard and the teacher had written five times seven. And the kid wrote 68. And the teacher was obviously not, <laughs> not pleased. And this kid in the cartoon is saying to the teacher, it may not be right, but that's how I feel. <laughs> so this is the mentality. It's what I feel. It's what makes me comfortable, uncomfortable, what gives me, what doesn't give me. There's very little thought of who needs you, not what do you need. And so there's very little happiness. The country that guarantees you the freedom to pursue happiness <laughs> is not producing too much happiness. Let me say something about being happy. Jumping ahead. There's a theory, popular theory. In order to be happy, you have to be grateful. If you feel like you're getting more than you need, that produces pleasure. Because that's called wealth. More than you need, you're rich. And that's pleasure. If you feel you're getting more than you deserve, that's joy. There's a difference. Happy and pleasure are two different things. Unhappy people desperately look for pleasure as a substitute, and it doesn't work. So people who are unhappy but having a lot of pleasure are headed for a depression. Because pleasure cannot substitute for happiness. Like, for example, don't eat when you're unhappy, when you're sad. Because the pleasure of the food is not going to make you happy. It'll only make you sick. So gratitude <coughs> is the key to happiness. And gratitude means I'm getting more than I deserve. So the formula of living a life for financial abundance, to have the freedom to do what you want, therefore you'll be happy, you disagree with? Oh, yeah. Because? That's, that's a recipe for a depression. Isn't that the formula taught by Western society? Yes. How are we doing? <laughs> You're the one all over the world. Are we How producing are we happy people? No. People try to stay busy so that they avoid the unhappiness in their lives. They run from place to place. They change partners. They change locations. They have to have a new car, a new house, a new kitchen, a new because they got to keep busy because they're not happy. Success, financial success, financial stability, a comfortable existence is, is a good 
setting. It's a good staging for life. But it doesn't substitute for life. So when a person has what he needs, that should free him to himself to what he is needed for. Now that you have what to eat, stop and think. Who needs you? Who else needs to eat? Who needs you or what do you want to do with the free time? What you should want to do with your free time is take care of other people's needs. So what about relaxing and time off and re-energizing? All of that is support for life. Life means, are you making a difference in other people's lives? I've got to tell you this little story. These two kids tried to kill themselves, 14-year-old kids. And one of them was being held for observation in the psych ward of the county hospital. Nobody can visit. It's too dangerous. Only clergy are allowed. So the mother asked me to go visit the kid. I didn't know them, I didn't know her, I didn't know the kid, but she needed a rabbi. Cause and I know how scary it is up there. And I thought, a 14-year-old kid, that's terrible. So of course, I went up to visit. It's like a prison, barred doors, armed guards. It's, I mean, there are maniacs there. And they're held for 48 hours. So I go up to visit this kid, and he is like in camp. He's lying there in bed with a comic book, and he's happy. I try to make conversation with him, not interested, nothing. I said, your mother is worried, what should I tell her? Whatever. For Ten minutes, I'm trying to, nothing, he doesn't, he's not interested. Finally, he says, why don't you go home? The chaplain has already been here, the hospital chaplain. So I said, what did he say? Something stupid. I said, well, now I'm really curious. What did he say? He said, I shouldn't kill myself because God loves me. I said, that's stupid? He says, yeah. I said, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Because I can't imagine God loves you. You're an obnoxious brat. <laughs> he says, yeah. <laughs> now he's interested. I said, look, God created you because he needs you. You're part of the puzzle. Without you, something would be missing in his plan. But I can't imagine he likes you. What's to like? So he's stuck with you. He says, well, what if I don't want to do what God wants from me? I said, well, yeah, freedom of choice. You have that. But at least now you're saying something. You do want, you don't want. At least there's an issue on the table now. Anyway, I went home thinking about it. I realized how right this kid is. If you are not necessary, but God loves you, that's really stupid. What's he loving? If we had to make a choice, would you rather be loved or needed? There's no question we'd rather be needed. Love is the icing on the cake. But what's the cake? To be needed. The kid tried to kill himself, not because he was in trouble. He tried to kill himself because he didn't think he was needed. So if I'm not needed, I'm leaving. The message that we have to strongly um, proclaim to those who are seeking happiness or pursuing happiness. You gotta be needed or you'll never be happy. Having what you need does not make a human being happy. That's creature comfort. That's good for an animal. It's not enough for a human being. Uh, this dovetails into a story you shared with me when you were younger and you went into high school about a marriage and um, all the kids wanted to marry the person they're going to fall in love with or the person they're going to be attracted to. And you were in a panel. Do you remember this story? No? What was the punchline? 
Uh, punchline is you don't know, <laughs> why get married. <coughs> ah. Aha. I think you were wearing a leather jacket, maybe. Yes. How does yeah. that how does that story fit in with this concept of liberty and happiness in marriage? It fits in quite well because <coughs> marriage as a um, metaphor for life, which is a good one, demands a certain degree of sanctity. A marriage without holiness I is just a partnership. It's not a marriage. A marriage has to have a certain degree of holiness to it. And that's why marriage is a divine invention. God never said which business to go into, but he did say to get married. So marriage has to have a certain sanctity or holiness to it. And when I was talking to these high school kids, and they were saying, uh, you can marry anybody you want, and you can... If you don't have a dimension, an ingredient of holiness to the marriage, then the marriage just becomes a source of friction. <coughs> There's that famous expression, familiarity breeds contempt, which is a very frightening thought. I mean, who gets more familiar than a husband and wife? And if familiarity breeds contempt, this marriage idea is not a good idea. Somebody said that in a few years from now, people are going to get married online. Online. They're never going to meet each other. So they'll be perfectly happy. <laughs> they, will, they will get married online. They'll have a ceremony online. They'll be a, a minister online. And, and it'll be a legal marriage. And, and they'll never have to see each other. That, that's the direction we're headed in. It'll be a virtual marriage. That's, that's not a marriage. Marriage has to have an element of holiness or sanctity to it, which means God has to play some role in your marriage, or it's not a marriage, it's just a virtual partnership. And tying it back to what we're talking about, you also feel that marriage is a sense of duty, it's a sense of giving, not getting? For sure, for sure. Why? Two people get married, and each of them is looking to get what they need. That's a disaster. Why share your life if your intention is to be selfish? It's a contradiction. <coughs> it's a contradiction. Come into my life so that I'll get what I need. That doesn't work. Can't work. Let's put it very, very succinctly. You don't want love from your spouse. I mean, this has got to be shouted from the rooftops. You don't need love from your spouse. If you need love, go home to your mother. <laughs> if you need love, you probably didn't get enough from your mother. So getting married doesn't mean I want to get love from my spouse. Marriage means I want my spouse's love. Huge difference. I don't need love from my wife. I need my wife's love. The same is true with children. <coughs> you don't need love from your children. That's very unhealthy. In your friendship. <laughs> <laughs> Not much better. You don't need love from your children. You need your children's love. Which means love is not the objective. The children are the <coughs> objective. In marriage, love is not the objective. The objective is to be married, to be, a, to be a we, to be an us. In that relationship, you want your spouse's love <coughs> and devotion and trust and time and money, <laughs> if they have any. So. The main thing is the connection, not to be me. So somebody says, how do I know I'm ready to get married? Say, well, look in the mirror in the morning. You get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you are fascinated by what you see. <laughs> <laughs>
don't get married. <laughs> You're having too much fun. <laughs> but if you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you say, oh, not you again. I need a new face. It's time to get married. In other words, enough about me. Now you're ready to get married. When do you start educating your children about the value or the need of giving? From the time they're three. <coughs> and do you actually verbalize it or is that just by example? Both. Every, in every possible way. I mean, <coughs> it's really a very... Um, it's a very fundamental life condition. So it has to start young because it's relevant. When you tell a child you can't take his, your friend's toy home, what are you telling him? You're telling him there's a reality beyond yourself. You love this toy. You've been playing with it for an hour. You want to take it home. That's your reality. There's a reality besides and that reality is in some way more important than yours. So you want to take the, the toy home. Your friend wants the toy to stay with him. Who wins? Your friend. That is a huge message in life. That's the antidote or the cure for narcissism. Every child is born narcissistic. The cure for it is it's a great toy. It's so much fun playing with this toy. But you're going to leave it because it's not yours. That's maturity. That's morality. That's wisdom. And that's the key to happiness. If someone else's need is important to you, you are a happy person. Taking a little bit of a segue and then coming back. What is mentorship? Okay, first, what is a mentor? Okay. A mentor is someone you don't like. You don't like. If you have a mentor and everything he tells you sounds good and feels good, he's not a mentor. He's your, he's your support system. He's your uh, fan club. A mentor pushes you where you're not comfortable going. The mentor is there to break you out of yourself into something bigger. And that's not always comfortable. A friend, see the Mishnah says, um, make yourself a teacher and acquire a friend. They go together. Because if you don't have a friend, there's no one there to encourage you to get a, a mentor, a teacher. So the friend pushes you to get a teacher. And then when the teacher tells you to do something, it's your friend that helps you get it done or reminds you that you need to do it. So the friend is your support. But your friend is too comfortable. A mentor is someone who can move you to where you wouldn't go by yourself because it's not comfortable. So you get your love from your mom, you give to your wife, your friend supports you and your mentor pushes you. Where's your dad? <laughs> Wait till he comes home. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says about their father. Wait till he comes home. Wait till your father comes home. Your father is your judge. If your father is pleased with you, you've made it. If your father is not pleased, try harder. So your mother is your, is your working coach. She's in there in the training with you, day by day in the trenches. And she says, wait till your father comes home. Not necessarily in the negative, you know, he'll beat you to a pulp. Wait till your father comes home and you can show him that you can now read or you can now add or subtract and he'll be so happy. So the father is like the seal of approval. And if he doesn't give you the seal of approval, back, back to the training <coughs> till you get it right. So the father is like the, um, the standard bearer. 
If you've pleased your father, you've made it. So how do you compare a father to a mentor? A father really can't be a mentor. A father can't be a mentor because? It's too close. It's so a father's not there to push you, he's there to judge you? <laughs> to set, a, the pain of to the set a standard. <laughs> <coughs> well, yeah, I mean, you can be a harsh judge, you can be a, a kind judge. But without the judge, you never know whether you're there or not. Mm. If there's no one to say, wow, you did it, then <coughs> you never know that you did do it. And that's why men growing up without their fathers are never content. They never know for sure whether they've made it. But some guy, the head of the men's movement, he says, every man needs an older man, a mentor. And he says, and your father can't be your mentor because you're both hung up on the same woman. <laughs> <laughs> Why should someone become a mentor? <coughs> See, this guy, he gets together men, huge gatherings of men. And he, he's, got a, he's got a pretty good message for you know, what men need and so <coughs> on. One of the things that he discovered is that in America, younger men don't look to older men, which has always been you know, the traditional, the wise old man. But in America, old men are not wise, they're useless. So nobody looks to older men, and he thinks that that's a tragedy. So he tried this at some point. He had this huge auditorium full of men. And before he started his talk, he said, anybody here over 65, raise your hand. And a couple of men raised their hand. He said, would you please come sit in the front? You're our elders. And he says, it changed the atmosphere in the room. It made such a difference. And basically his message was, if you're a young man and you don't have an older man, a mentor, giving you his blessing, then you are living with a hole in your heart. And if you're an older man and you've never given a younger man your blessings, then you're responsible for the hole in his heart. What if somebody is not confident enough that he can be a mentor? What will it take? What does it take to be a mentor? That's a great question. What does it take to be a mentor? Yeah, we usually <laughs> think it takes great genius, know-it-all, uh, with perfect advice. To be a mentor means the ability to see another person and their needs without imposing your own shtick. So that you're not telling the person to do something that you felt frustrated about yourself and you're living your life through him and you're giving the advice really you should be getting, but since you think about yourself, that's what comes to mind. So basically a mentor means someone who has stopped worrying about himself and therefore can give advice to others. And now we're going back to the giving. So when are you ready? Getting out of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, do you agree with goal setting? For sure. Is it how specific does it need to be? How general does it need to be? How often does it need to be? Living with a, with a plan is, is, is a very responsible and intelligent way to live. Living day to day is not is not uh, it's just it's not use it's not useful and it's not <coughs> it's not appropriate. <coughs> you want to live with a plan. <coughs> your day should have a structure. Your year should have a structure. One of the things that people were in awe of the Rebbe, he had a thirty year plan, and it was as clear as as the the desktop he sat in front of. Very few people have a 30-year plan. We have 30-year wishes. I, I know what I want to do when I retire, but that's very vague. The Rebbe had a 30-year plan, year by year, month by month. So not too many people are capable of that. 
and you don't have to push beyond your limits. But to have a, a plan for the year, for the next five years, very healthy, very, very good for your, uh, for long life. Which dovetails into prayer versus action. How much does a person pray and how much does he go out there and do? How does a person, quote unquote, have balance? That, that's a tricky one. You know God runs the world, why don't you just let him run it? <coughs> and the more you believe God runs the world, the more tempted you are to say, fine, so run it. I'm going to sleep. And whatever happens, happens, because he's in charge, so what do you want from me? On the other hand, we know that God wants us to partner with him, to be active partners, so that if you see the, the sick, <coughs> heal them. If you see the hungry, feed them. You see the naked, dress them. Don't sit back and wait for God to do it. So when it comes to our own business, or even in our own health, how much should I worry about my health? Should I go to a doctor every month? Or should I just trust that God will take care of it? The bottom line is, you have to do what you have to do so that God can do what he has to do. They're not two separate projects. It's not like if I do a lot of work, what's God going to do? And if God's running the world, then what do you need me for? I do what I'm supposed to do so that God can pick up from there and the plan proceeds. So I go to work because I'm supposed to. Will I succeed in work? Will today be a good day? Will this investment be a good investment? That's up to God. I'll do the work. I'll do the leg work. The rest is up to him. And the more comfortable we are with that idea, the more confidence we have. Go ahead, make the investment. God will do the rest. And if it doesn't work, something goes wrong, you make a bad investment, you did what you had to do. The rest is up to God. So there are no regrets. The same is true, of course, with a doctor. The doctor does his best to heal the patient. But then what happens? Well, what happens? That's up to God. So should the doctor not even bother? If he does bother and he loses the patient, God forbid, should he blame himself? How do you live with yourself like that? <coughs> so it's true of everything. How do, you, how do you have the courage to get married? You know who to marry? You're sure that this is the right woman for you? How can you make a decision like that? <laughs> On the other hand, you can't sit back and wait for God to do it. Sadaka. <laughs> right. The word sadaka is translated to English as charity. Do you agree with that translation? Not really. Charity means you're giving away what is yours to someone who hasn't earned it. Tzedakah means righteousness. Mm -hmm. Righteous means not beyond the letter of the law. Righteous means it's only right. It's only right that if I have two sandwiches, one of them is not meant for me. And that goes for money, it goes for time, it goes for knowledge. The needy person's need is more real than mine. So if I happen to have what he needs, well, add two and two, he needs it, you have it. No? Logic. <laughs> and the same is true with husband and wife. <coughs> this woman says, my husband is, uh, is so, such a perfectionist that I have to do everything perfectly. I said, can you? She says, yeah, but why do I have to? So wait a minute, you have what he needs. This is a match made in heaven. <laughs> a husband <coughs> says, my wife is so needy, she always needs attention. I said, so do you have 
patience and time to give her the attention? He says, yeah, but why does she need so much attention? I said, what kind of question is that? You know why you're married to her? Because you have what she needs. <laughs> so it's perfect. When we start to sit and measure, am I giving more than I'm getting? I've been nice to her for a week now. Is that enough? <laughs> you have what she needs. Perfect. So the same is true in everything. You have advice to offer. This person needs advice. Guess why you got together. Guess why divine providence brought you to each other. It's just so clear. We lose our confidence when we lose sight of the goal. Knowing what our goal is makes life so much easier. The goal is whatever you were given, deliver it where it belongs. You were given a life to make a difference. Make the difference. You were introduced to certain people, your circle, your world, your community, for a reason. Well, fulfill that reason. When you're focused on the goal, everything else becomes easy. <coughs> so how does one find their goal? How does one find their life purpose? A mentor helps keep you on track. And divine providence. Look around. Look at what's happening. A group of women <coughs> went to a conference from New York to Detroit, middle of the winter. On the Sunday that they were supposed to all be flying back to New York, there was a snowstorm and they were stranded. So they called the Debbie's office and said, We're stuck here. What are we supposed to do? The Debbie said, Stuck? If you can't leave, it means you haven't finished your job. There's something more you're supposed to be doing where you are. Finish, then you'll be able to come home. <laughs> so you're never stuck. You're always where you are for a reason. So if your business isn't going well, it's for a reason. If your marriage isn't going well, it's for a reason. And the fact that it's so more painful means it's more important. Now you're going to ask me, so how do you know when it's time to quit? Oh, I don't think you ever quit. <coughs> there are times when you're supposed to quit. Wow. There are times when it's time to quit, whether it's a marriage or a business or a town. There's time to get out of town. <coughs> but that's the last resort. And even for that, there has to be some <coughs> indication. Something has to come into your life that makes the move appropriate, necessary, realistic. So if a marriage really has gone immoral, it might be time to get out. So tying this all into a practical application, 24-year-old out of college with a degree wants to move forward with a career. How does he make that decision? How would you advise him to make that decision? You look at your talents, your inclinations, you look at your uh, aptitudes, or if, you know, you've got to have it tested and see what you're good at. But you have to want something. A guy who's 24 out of college and doesn't know what he wants, something's wrong. He's got he's to get himself back on track in life, not just in career. Everybody wants something. Maybe we don't admit it to ourselves, but we talk to somebody. Somebody says, so what do you want to do? I say, oh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? There are only three or four options that are realistic in your life. Which one of them do you like best? You do have a preference. You just haven't focused on it. I have this very impressive little um, anecdote. There was this radio psychologist. Most of them are you know, so-so. This guy was really smart. This woman calls up and says, I've got two guys who want to marry me. I don't know which one to pick. What do I do? 
most people would say, well, tell me about these two guys and what's good about this one and what do you like about that one. It can take a year to unravel this. This guy said to her on the phone, he said, okay, so imagine it's 10 years from now. You're in your kitchen, you know, the kitchen you always wanted. You're in your kitchen, you're standing at the sink, the door opens behind you, and he says, hi, I'm home, and you turn around and it's, and she says, Jim. He says, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so we really do know. Maybe we're afraid to tell even uh, to tell ourselves to make a decision for yourself to yourself. But if somebody really asks you, it's it's you know you know what you want, and you go for it. Any final comments about life, liberty, pursuit of happiness? The pursuit of happiness is killing us. <laughs> you can't pursue happiness. It's a terrible thing. It's, it's really, it's an unhealthy thing to do. You cannot base a life on a pursuit of happiness. Again, happiness comes from gratitude. Gratitude comes from the feeling that you're getting more than you deserve. The truth is, and we realize this when we get older, but somebody should tell us when we're young, the truth is we don't deserve anything. You can't deserve to be born. <coughs> you haven't done anything. So being born is already a gift beyond all things that you can never repay. So how can you be deserving after you've been given this gift for free? You're already indebted, right? Everything that comes after that, you're even more indebted. So you had a healthy childhood, you grew up, you're not sick, you're capable, you're functional. How are you ever going to repay this? So everything that happens in addition to that, you got to be grateful because you don't deserve. Not because we're bad. This is not a negative or critical thought. It's just the truth of the nature of existence and of life. We are given life for free. We're indebted. If we focus on that, then here's how it works. If you feel you're getting more than you deserve, then you are happy. To feel that you're getting more than you deserve, you have to recognize the gift of life. So that when something happens the way you were hoping, you go for a job and you get the job, you are so grateful that you are happy. Real happiness. If you don't get the job, you're not depressed because what, is it like you deserve the job and you couldn't get it? You don't deserve it. So try for something else. Maybe you'll deserve that. People who feel they deserve are headed for trouble. Because almost anything that happens will not be satisfied. You get the job, but oh, should have tried for a bigger job. You negotiated a salary and you got it. Oh, should have asked for more. Or you don't get it. Now you're totally depressed. So if you think you deserve, then life is going to destroy you. Because if you can't get what you deserve, you're going to be suicidal. If life is that bad, if reality is that evil, if life stinks because you can't even get what you deserve, you can't live like that. So the first message in life from childhood on. It's not you're a bad kid. You can be the greatest kid. You don't deserve. Everything you get is for free. So if you, to view, you expect to get the job, yes. You make an investment, you expect it to be successful, absolutely. On what grounds? On the grounds that you've gotten everything else for free, why would God quit now? So you go there optimistic that God will give you more stuff for free, like he has until now. If he doesn't, okay. It's not like, where is my success? So it unburdens us, it frees us, it liberates us. So if we are really the land of the free <laughs> and the home of the brave, 
We've got to stop pursuing happiness. Start pursuing purpose. And then life is happy for free. Thank you very, very much, Rabbi.